Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. I want to mention again, with the current events taking place in and around Israel, I'm teaching a series that, in my opinion, is very crucial to understanding the end times. Today, we're going to continue to look at the events through careful study of God's Word, which we should be doing all along, and the prophetic scriptures that the Bible talks about that shows us what is going to take place in the last day's calendar. Now let's continue with our previous lesson on Elam and Iran in biblical prophecy. As I stated in my previous lesson, there are two prophecies mentioned in the Bible concerning Iran in these last days. One is Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39, and the other is Ezekiel 38, verse 5. Now Ezekiel 38, 5 identifies Iran by its ancient name Persia, and refers to part of the coalition involved in the Gog Magog War. Now, Ezekiel 38 specifically mentions, as I said, Persia as an ally. And the passage in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39 talks about Iran as well as it, it's referred to in its ancient name, Elam. Now, according to several respected prophecy scholars and theologians, they say the historical tracking and scriptural evidence suggests that the Elamite prophecy in Jeremiah remains unfulfilled and is a separate war from that of the Gog and Magog one. Now, both these prophecies will most likely see their fulfillment prior to the beginning of the tribulation period. So we need to see the significance of the modern-day region of Elam in Iran. What is going on in the Elam region, and why is it so important to Iran? It's the center of Iran's strategic development of its nuclear program. Think of that, its nuclear program. See, if you, first of all, you have Iran's Bushner uh, nuclear power reactor. One of their chief nuclear sites is the Bushner uh, nuclear reactor inside the boundaries of ancient Elam. It's loaded with Russian-made nuclear fuel rods. And the Bushra uh, project began in 1975 under the Shah of Iran's government, but came to an abrupt halt in 1979 during the Islamic Revolution when German manufacturers withdrew from the project. The Iranians were unable to complete it, so they contracted with the Russian government, and the reactor became operational in May of 2011. The Busher um, nuclear plant sits on top of three tectonic plates, making it very vulnerable to seismic activity. So that may not be a good place for it. Uh, on April 9th, uh, 2013, in, in the province, there was a 6.3 earthquake that killed 37 people and injured another 850 people. Iran has the right under the Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, the NPT, to develop a nuclear program, but only for civilian use. However, since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, the status of its nuclear program remains in dispute. Iran has been operating in non-compliance with its NPT uh, safeguards and agreements. According to Reuters, the news agency, one of the IAEA confidential quarterly reports to member states as of September 2023, the International Atomic Energy Agency said Iran's stockpile of uranium enriched up to 60% purity, close to roughly 90% of weapons grade. The IAEA says there has been no progress in resolving the outstanding safeguard issues referring to Iran's failure to credibly explain the origin of uranium particles found at two undeclared sites. They continue to refuse access to inspectors uh, to several sites as well. And Israel and a majority of the international community, they don't trust Iran's stated nuclear intentions for peaceful means especially since they constantly make threats against Israel. What else is there in the Elam area? Well, it's Iran's air defense systems. In 2019, the Iranian Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, under the direction of the Iranian authorities, opened a new command and control center in the Bushar um, province, which is at the coastal area of the northeastern Persian Gulf. It's in the Elam area. 
It's along Iran's coast south of uh, Kuzestan and north of, uh, was it, Hormuzgan. And, and the Iran it's hard to pronounce those words sometimes. And the Iranian province, a province that sits astride of the Strait of Hormuz. Think of that. It's right there in the Persian Gulf. And the new Persian Gulf Air Defense Command Center is supposed to be theoretically to coordinate both the IRGC and the Iranian Army Air Force and, and its operations in the Persian Gulf. Also there in that same area of Elam is Karg Island, which uh, over 90% of Iran's oil is exported. And Asa Luyea is a town in the central Boucher um, uh, province, which is the closest Iranian port to the offshore South Pars gas field. I mean, recently, but this is important because recently both a natural gas pipeline and an oil pipeline have been built not too far from the shoreline in the area. And it just so happens that the region of Elam in Iran is also the location for many of Iran's air defense systems. And this includes underground air bases, underground missile silos, and portable rocket launchers that are capable of launching ballistic missiles using long-range, medium, and short-range missiles. Iran is constantly boasting that they can reach Israel in minutes with their missiles and wipe Israel off the face of the map. Iran also boasts of its other core military capabilities, such as anti-access and, and, and area denial, along with the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, uh, a critical choke point for the world's oil supply. So they're, they're, they're saying they can attack that. This includes ship and shore launched anti-ship uh, missiles, cruise missiles, ASCMs. Uh, they can do fast attack crafts. They've got fast inshore attack craft, naval mines, submarines, unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as UAVs or drones, anti-ship uh, ballistic missiles, and air defense systems. I mean, they're stocked with weaponry. Iran has been constantly working on advancing their capabilities of using missile forces, naval forces, air attack, and defense forces, and their ground forces, including the creation of new rapid response brigades that could enable them to become more agile and effective, all from the Elam area. I mean, many of these capabilities are located in and around uh, the area of Elam. Now, with that, that knowledge, we need to know that Elam, or Iran's first war prior to the tribulation, is going to take place. I mean, through studying God's word and the passages on prophecy, if we read the scriptures literally, as we should, except for where it explains that symbology, and symbology is used, it will explain that it's doing that very thing. I mean, we discover a lot of information is given about the last days when we look at it that way. Now, I've come to believe that there will be two major coming wars with Israel, most likely uh, uh, two more important wars that take place before the Antichrist appears on the scene and the tribulation period begins, which is also known as Daniel's 70th week. Now, the war with Elam and the war with Syria are either two separate wars or they're combined with the Great Middle East War that I'll be teaching on here in a few weeks. Uh, but it's either separate ones or it's combined with that one. But there'll be three there. And then, the, then add on to that, the Gog and Magog War. Now we'll look at these in coming lessons. But for now, let's look at Iran's involvement in actions towards Israel. We know that they're, they're readily involved in the things going on around that area. I mean, Iran's desire to acquire or build their own nuclear weapons has been well known to the world. One minute, they say they want nuclear capabilities for civilian usage, such as electricity. Then they turn around and threaten the United States and Israel with being able to destroy them and publish illustrative videos. Yes, videos that they post, they're like uh, uh, illustrations, with ballistic missiles destroying strategic targets in Israel. And then they show an, a nuclear mushroom cloud appearing at their detonation. And that only happens if there's a nuclear weapon involved. Now, the Prime Minister uh, uh, Netanyahu has warned the world that if Iran is left to continually build their nuclear enrichment, that they would eventually achieve a nuclear weapon. 
and Iran has declared that they now have enough nuclear material to build a nuclear weapon. And Israel has declared that they will have to deal with Iran if they build one. See, the Iranian hatred towards Israel is satanically inspired, and it's propagated under the disguise of a holy quest to see Israel destroyed and to usher in the Islamic vision of ruling the entire world in the end of the ages. Iran has been waging a proxy war against Israel for several years by supporting the terrorist groups Hezbollah in, in uh, Lebanon, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, and others. And they have been providing money, training, rockets, and other armaments to these terror groups to keep their ongoing skirmishes going against Israel. Iran says they're doing this for the Palestinians. But if they drop a nuclear bomb on Israel, as they have, as they have threatened to do so many times, how is that helping the Palestinians? Of course, it won't be helping anyone because the Palestinians would die at the hands of their supposed benefactors along with Israel and would make the whole area unlivable for many years to come. So see, we can know by reading the prophecies concerning the end times that this will not happen in Israel because God has a lot planned for Israel in the last days. The last day prophecies contain many things in store for Israel, including such things as more wars, the temple being rebuilt, the tribulation period, Christ's second coming, and the millennial kingdom of Jesus the Messiah being built. So what about explaining the prophecy against Elam? Well, according to the prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 49, he says that God is going to bring judgment against Elam. It's the southwestern portion of the nation of Iran. This prophecy concerning Elam only covers the six verses that appears to be predicting a forthcoming disaster in that area, possibly even a nuclear catastrophe. I mean, let's break down the prophecy by each verse to see what will take place. God had appointed this war to happen, but most likely it will pl take place through either natural disasters or military action instead of God supernaturally interceding, which he can do, as he does in the Gog-Magog war, though. Now, Jeremiah 49.34 says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Well, when we read that passage, since this prophecy has, has yet to be fulfilled, as many scholars and theologians believe, and because this appears to happen before the Gog-Magog war takes place, this will happen sometime soon. Jeremiah 49, 35 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. Now, in our last lesson, I mentioned that the people of Elam were known for their archery skills. And archers could shoot their arrows with great precision, and sometimes their arrows would be dipped into poison or set on fire to do greater damage. Today, some scholars today say we can possibly compare Iran's ballistic missiles as arrows being launched with great precision with programming to hit exactly where they are aimed at. Missiles with explosive or nuclear warheads can be considered tipped with fire and poison because of their destructive nature and the radiation. Now, according to Iran, their missiles can travel like 1,300 miles from Israel or from Iran down to Israel and rain destruction and fire on the people there. If they have nuclear warheads, it would not only destroy everything in its path, but would poison the land, the air, and the water with radiation, thus basically wiping Israel off the face of the earth as they have stated they intend to do. But here's where it gets interesting. I love this. Jeremiah 49, 35 says that God will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. However, see, God however God chooses to do this, it'll be in his will, he will destroy their launching capabilities, or in other words, breaking their bow, their bow. And so they won't be able to harm Israel. See, they rely heavily on their offensive and their defensive weaponry, oil, and more in the Elam, Elam area. As, as their, their show of protection and military might, uh, it will be eliminated. 
Jeremiah 49, 36 says, And I will bring upon Elam the four winds and the four quarters of heaven, and I will scatter them to all those winds, and there shall be no nation to which those driven out of Elam shall not come. See, the four winds from the quarters of heaven symbolizes a dispersing of refugees to other places. What this is saying is that the people in the Elam area will be scattered to the nations worldwide. Then Jeremiah 49, 37 says, I will terrify Elam before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them and my anger, my fierce anger, declares the Lord. I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. Now, when this prophecy is fulfilled, it will terrify the Iranians because of all their boasting and reliance on their military capabilities will be shattered. Iran's, um, uh, Iran, it has enemies, think about this, around the world due to their support of terrorism. But the Bible doesn't tell us who these enemies are of Iran. But I would venture to say that Israel is number one on that list, and possibly the United States right behind them, and they will seek to eliminate Iran's leadership. The term, send the sword after them, is usually interpreted as a military invasion in the typology of biblical terminology. So what does Iran do to cause God to react to them in his fierce anger? anger his fierce anger. Well, Iran's quest for regional power, which includes the potential acquisition of nuclear weapons and equipping their surrogates with missiles, could have something to do with it. It may be caused by a provocation against Israel, where Iran's leadership declares it its intention to follow through with their threats of destruction that they have been making so far for many years, many years. God will turn the tables on Iran and bring great destruction on them when they try to harm Israel. Jeremiah 49, 38 says, And I will set my throne in Elam and destroy their king and officials, declares the Lord. Now, it's unknown at this point how much of the leadership of Iran will be destroyed, but it's most likely that any government official or military leader over the Elam area of Iran who happens to physically be there will be killed in the disaster or poisoned by radiation if nuclear power is involved. Now, let's look at Jeremiah 49, 39. It says, but in the last days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. God has a future plan for the area of ancient Elam, which is not known at this time, and it may come even come under this jurisdiction and the rule of Israel at some time, point in time. It may just happen. But there's a disaster going to take place in Elam. So to complete the analysis of Elam and the Iranian war that will take place, we need to examine what will cause the great defeat and the destruction of this area. We need to remember that the biblical text in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 38, you know, verse 39 is for a later time and does not simply say that Elam was defeated. It just doesn't say that. It also gives us the many details of what actually happens after the defeat. So let's gather the clues from what we've looked at. Does the disaster come from a massive earthquake, uh, a military invasion, or maybe it's some major airstrike or something else? With Iran's uh, uh, Busher uh, nuclear plant sitting on top of three tectonic plates, uh, think of that. What, what's going to take place there? What will happen? Uh, I mean, they've got uh, storage facilities, missile silos, underground bunkers. They've got military bases. They've got uh, gas and oil and weaponry, uh, nuclear research facilities. And, and it may include nuclear weapons at some point, if it not already isn't there. I mean, it looks like Jer Jeremiah's war in Elam is available to happen in the near future at any moment plus the fact that they are considered the largest supplier of terrorism in the world, which is unsettling to many people. So they've got a big target pay, placed on their back based on all this stuff that they have there. I mean, it's a major target for Iran's enemies and a disaster waiting to happen. 
So does this disaster come from massive earthquakes uh, that destroys the nuclear power plant or causes uh, a radiation leak? Who knows? I mean, those, those radiation leaks could pollute the air, seep into groundwater, uh, kill scores of people, and make the whole area unlivable. It's a military invasion, strategic attacks, or major airstrikes that will virtually do the same thing. Will it be a war that happens so quickly that it overcomes the Iranians in Elam, like a tidal wave of destruction and devastation and annihilation? Is it a mixture of all the above and more? Well, I'll let you know this. All of this is possible in our present day. All of it. Or, or is it some, something else? I mean, this prophecy found in Ezekiel 38 and 39 appears to separate it from the Gog Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38 39. The Gog and Magog prophecy in the book of Ezekiel does not contain any references to that of Elam. For I, I would just say, you know, although Jeremiah tells uh, Elam's worldwide dispersions uh, of this area of southwestern uh, Iran, According to Ezekiel, there will still be people in northern Iran that is referred to as Persia and will join the eventual Gog and Magog coalition of the Russian, Turkey, Iran, and other Arab state coalition that is going to come against Israel. With the Russian, Turkey, and Iran and, and Arab invasion of Israel, what are they going to do? What's going to happen? Well, we believe that that will happen after this one. What we do know is that in the last days, most likely before the tribulation period begins, the nations and the terrorist populations of that whole area who stand in the way of God's plans for Israel are about to fall into the hands of the living God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's what's going to happen to them. The removal of the enemies of Israel will make way for the Antichrist to begin his takeover of, the, of much of the world and position himself to make some type of treaty or arrangement with Israel that once signed will begin the seven-year tribulation period and the countdown for the second coming of Christ. Now, I'm going to close at this point, but I want you to understand something. When, as, I, as I mentioned before, we're looking at several different wars. We're looking at the possibility of, of this um, Elam War, a Syrian War, a Great Middle East War, and they'll all be separate or they can be combined together, those three, but I believe they'll be separate. And then after that, the Gog Magog War. Once that is over, you will see that, that it's, it'll be close to the time of the tribulation period. Rapture can happen anytime, but with these wars, there's a progression. They mention certain things that the other ones don't. So we're gonna find those, those, those clues out, why we believe they're gonna happen like this. Uh, and, and, it, and it makes a lot of sense because certain things can't happen with the Gog Magog war until the, the, the great Middle East war takes place. So we need to look at the progression and I'll share a bit more of that with you. But, uh, you know, thank you again for joining with me today for this message. I, re I really appreciate it. I, I hope you enjoy studying with me because I have a lot of information and I want to make sure that we all understand it together. And, and so to find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our YouTube and Facebook uh, areas, you can find in the narrative uh, that you can find a link to our messages including this one that we've been recording for for the last several years. Um, and if you'd like to know more about uh, Center Points Christian Fellowship, sign up for our weekly newsletter or updates, uh, anything like that, just uh, email me at um, info at centerpoints.org. You can find out about our Wednesday night Bible study or Wednesday, Thursday, or, or Thursday women's Bible study. Uh, all you have to do is just send me that email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.